Hey, it's the Chief, bonding with board games. We're gonna be talking about pub battles. Little Bighorn, 1876, Custer. Uh, Custer's uh, annihilation of his units that are there. And uh, lots and lots of Sioux, and I believe Cherokee, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Let's go ahead and take a look. I'll show you this beautiful map and the pieces, then we'll come out and I'll give you my thoughts. All right, so here's our overview of the map. These are going to be your measuring sticks, basically, but they're, they're these little chains, just so you can see. I kind of call them like coin purse chains or, I don't know, almost like dog tag chains. Nobody uses them anymore. But they're cool, and you'll see there's the color, more of a gold and then more of a brass. You, uh, based on, if you're retreating, you're retreating one-third of your movement. If you're going over uh, a hill crest, you're reduced by a third. So they've broken these chains into one third, which is awesome. Down there is if you're mounted, and this is if you're on foot. So you can see kind of the difference there. The Native Americans, let me zoom in, and I'll kind of come up over top of the map here. All right, the Native Americans start on these individual little tribes. You can see how they're all kind of segmented out. And you're going to blindly write down on a, we did it on a post-it note, which one of these tribes are actually going to be present. We just went by color. Now, they could all be present, or you might decide to only have this one, the light blue, the dark blue, and the yellow in. So that's written down, but this is what is full open view. So uh, these are your non-combatants, your civilians, children, uh, old people. Uh, this is kind of like their command counter, their tribal marker. It also counts as uh, basically a battle piece, a piece on foot. Uh, because later, these will be guys on foot. And these will be mounted, if I can get it to focus, mounted warriors that will join in. The terrain is key. You'll see we, you have a river, you have the forest. So if you're in, uh, if you have a piece in forest, uh, the attacking party that's trying to attack you in the forest is going to have a minus one of their die rolls. I'll get into combat in a little bit. Um, it's also harder to move through forest. It's harder to move through ridges, which you can just see right here when you cross the second part of that ridge. You've basically gone up onto another level and that will cost you a third of whatever your total movement is. And if you're going to cross a river and you're not crossing at a ford, you can see there's a little tiny ford there. It's a little shallow area. If you're not crossing there, it halts you in the water. And boy, are you exposed if you're attacked in the water. I believe this arrow is showing which way the river runs. It doesn't really matter for the game. Um, and then if I pan not too quickly, See if I can get up here, I'll show you where the cavalry start. Uh, there's a little cross up there. I don't know if that's where Custer and them finally died or what the significance is. So up near the compass spot here, let me zoom in, and I'll show you that that is where you see this little outline. That is where Custer's troops, the battalions, have to start in this box. And let me pull back out and I'll show you the units before they go on the board. All right, just a little more of the bits. Uh, they all function the same. They each have two uh, mounted warrior units. Um, when a tribe over here comes into view, you'll just take all of these and place them uh, in their little tribal area. The dice that they'll be rolling. These discs, uh, I put them in a bag. It says put them in a cup, but you draw them out, and this is how the turn order is going to set. And it looks like I'm missing one. So I'll have to go see where that is. Uh, but you draw them in, and that's what's going to determine who goes first. And then there's some interesting rules on the cavalry because of their training and expertise. They can sometimes they can get to go first, or they can refuse to turn and go later. Uh, you'll see their die, and then I have them set up in their individual units up here. Let me zoom in on that. So you can see the individual units. These are their headquarters, their command pieces, and these little pieces here, these gold ones and then this one for Custer, are going to be in the square that's up at the top of the map. And this is the only information. You're going to put all of them on the board, so whoever's playing the Native Americans isn't going to know if you've only picked one battalion, two, three, or four. You might have all four in written down on a piece of paper, but you're going to have all four displayed so there's a little fog of war. And there's a cool little rule section that if uh, you decide you're only going to do one battalion, you got to do them in this order. So it would be just Custer's. 
If you did two, you'd have to have Custer and Reno's battalion. Three, and then if you want to add in um, Mate, these are the Gatling guns, these little red deals, and that, that thing there is the mule supply train that helps you uh, recover quicker when you take a hit. Basically like getting more ammo, I think. Um, so if you want all four, you just write down and bring in all four of them in, and then you're maneuvering on the board. All right, I'm going to bring some of the paper on just show you real quick. So when you get this, this is your uh, multiplayer, uh, how you're going to handle some rules. But the first thing this does is just identify the pieces so the command chits go in the cup or the bag. Your headquarters are the ones that will be placed on the board. Fog of War, same deal with these guys and the non-combatants, and it tells you the number. Also tells you how you're going to sticker them. So the Native American pieces have a natural wood finish. Whereas the uh, trooper pieces, if I can bring one on, they have a lacquered kind of navy blue finish. And so you're going to then label with stickers each of the pieces just to match this. So it explains everything, gives you the tribe names, all right, and then tells you how to sticker them and explains who they are. Um, you've got your quick start guide, which for me, the quick start rules just didn't do it for me. They were great to go back and refer to when I was looking at my actions and stuff, and it explains some things. But, oh, it also covers your uh, modifiers for if you're in woods. So moving through woods is, uh, you pay one third, all right? And then attackers are minus one coming in. Attacking is very simple, by the way. When two units are touching, you each roll two dice, and four fives and sixes hit. So one, twos, and threes don't. You use your modifiers, um, and there are some different little special rules for um, Native Americans as militia, and then the elite Custer troops, which I'll show you in a little bit. So it covers your rates of march, which yes, the chains do this. So you get that feel on this sheet. This is, um, let's see, your historical brief that you can read over, which was handy. Like I said, Bo and I talked a lot about the real history. We even went and watched the Netflix, um, I think it was a Ken Burns little deal on, uh, on the uh, Custer's battle. And then the rules of play. And this was actually what I went in and fully read before I played. I really needed to fully understand maybe it's just me but come on i mean i can read seven eight pages to fully understand and you can see they've got everything laid out uh real simply and good so you can see uh units can get surrounded and then how you're going to work through your combat let me go in and just show you some of that now i'm not going to show you all the maneuver um i've talked about it but let me just show you kind of how some close in actions will happen and then we'll get out of here. We won't spend too much time going in detail on that. All right, just to show a little bit of how the game works and I'm gonna kind of fudge everything a little bit because obviously they would have seen each other already and all these would have populated. But let's just pretend these aren't here. So you have this, this uh, Custer command unit and you have the non-combatant and the tribal marker. Once they're within a mile of each other, and there's no terrain in between, so you can see these are mountains or ridges and woods. So there's no terrain in between. They're within a mile of each other. They can see each other and you will populate them. So all of these um, warrior pieces will come on. So um, facing, they would come out. Generally, they're going to protect these non-combatants. So you'll literally just put these on. I always have the arrows doing the facing. I'm not going to go fiddle through that now, though it'll drive me a little crazy not having them done that way. And you have to put them down within one third, so one of these pieces of each other. Same thing's going to happen with Custer's unit. Now this headquarters piece actually counts as a combat unit. They're not just like a command and control piece. Obviously Custer and them fought. Again, ignore these up here. Pretend they aren't here. Let me do this to make it easier. So one of the keys of this is if I set these units up like so, all right, you can see if I did this, a Native American piece cannot cross through the line because the block can't fit in between these blocks. However, if they were moving in their movement phase, and I'll get into those, 
you can see he could move through here and he could come all the way through in the movement and I could actually get multiple units that would have been able to come in and while sitting flush they could get everywhere but right to Custer's front. So I wouldn't be able to move the Custer piece so that nobody could come in on this side but they would be attacking him on three sides. The other thing I would I will tell you I've got them face up but this would be their as if they'd been hit. I'm going to get into that in a second because I'll show you. So I would have actually done something like this or even had Custer because he's a combat unit as well doing something like so. Alright, and by putting the ridge to my side, this unit may even be protected because the Native Americans wouldn't have enough uh, movement because it would cost them one third their movement, sorry that's mounted, to get up onto that ridge, more than likely. Alright, so they wouldn't be able to even come around and flank me on the ridge because it would cost them too much movement to come up onto that hill and then to come back down. Which is true to life. Uh, if a unit's forming up and they have a natural barrier, a, a hill, they're going to use that hill to their advantage. So what's beautiful in this game is the placing, the spacing matters. And now if the Native Americans came up to fight, they could only do one-on-one -on -one as they came up, excuse me, as they came up to battle. And I'll show that. You could even have a a mounted unit. Again the mounted units are going to move further um, as shown by those little by these little deals here. And the other little caveat is once the cavalry troops are engaged in combat they no longer move in their mounted form. They only move on foot. Uh, either showing that their horses run away or they're exhausted or whatnot. But this is the form you would see for movement and then into combat. All right, just to show, um, I'm going to, the lighting's terrible, so I'm not going to have this on here, but I'll cover this. So the first thing you're doing is you're placing, so when you begin a turn, you got these command chits. All right, every unit has one. You're going to place them in a cup, place them in a bag. Uh, those are all placed in there. You're going to pull out these command chips, and that's going to allow, this would allow the yellow Native American uh, units to move. This first key point is just for the movement. Now when I put them down off to the side of the map, I list an order so I can remember the order in which they were drawn. So in other words, if I then pulled out Custer's unit, I would just have it off to the side. Again, I use the edge of the map to line them up. The key for this is, is everybody gets their pieces drawn and they maneuver them. So you could have conceivably that yellow Native American markers drawn and maybe I've even split my forces and they're back over here well they would be able to maneuver in and engage Custer from the rear and they're surrounding him which would be a terrible spot for Custer to be in but no combat's happening yet this is all movement now there is a very very interesting rule where the um, control pieces you'll see Custer if you can see it has a four he has the ability if, his, if he wants to try to change the turn order due to their training. So if he wanted to go first for movement, he could roll a die. And if he gets a 1, 2, 3, or 4, all right, he's going to be able to exert his command or his training and be able to go first. Or if his piece were drawn, he could roll that die and get it put back into the cup or back into the bag. Now each piece can only do that once, the, the cavalry pieces. So I couldn't continue to do it, but I can exert that. Uh, it comes in real handy if I'm wanting to go first and, and get a real slick move in because again, his goal may be to push through and capture a non-combatant piece. The other thing that Custer himself has is his units, uh, when they move, he can conduct one combat. And he gets to do that, obviously, before the full combat phase. Um, so it's a nice way for him to come in, move, do a combat, and maybe even shoot through a gap or something in the lines. Makes him a very valuable and dangerous piece. Once every chit 
has been drawn, all the movements done, you're then going to come back and resolve combat. Combat is considered to be simultaneous, even though you're going to be resolving it in the order of which it happened. So um, the Native American red units are going to roll, and they're going to be trying to get four fives or sixes. Now the Native Americans have an interesting rule. On their very first combat, they're considered militia, untrained militia. Their first hit in combat, so that first hit they're going to get is going to count as two hits. Why does that matter? Well, you really only have uh, the ability to take three hits. When you're hit, and this is where it gets fiddly for me because I'm going to have to show you. First of all, all these units really would have been down like so, down like so, and down like so. This is the point where I, I mentioned later on, I think in my wrap-up, how I wish I had a colored, I'm going to get some colored pens and put dots on these because I'm always having to check and see who's who. So if this red unit attacks and gets a hit on this unit, you would flip it up to show that it's taken a hit. On its second hit, it must retreat away from the battle. If it either can't retreat or it takes a third hit, it's destroyed, it's wiped out. So on the very first hit by militia, you can see it's shocking because you could literally have a unit overwhelmed quickly and destroyed. But let's just say this unit only hit it once. Well, that would count as a double hit on its first try, so it's going to end up retreating. There is an area for it to retreat away from the battle, which quite honestly, you got to know that unit would run into the woods, being attacked from both the front and the rear, and the only place to go. It has to retreat. Now they can retreat through friendly units, but you wouldn't say it would retreat further into combat. So it would retreat to these woods, I guarantee that's where I would go. And that's where Pub Battles tells you is, come on, where would that unit go if it was hit, overwhelmed, and taking massive damage? You know it would peel off to the woods. If I was in that unit, I would call out Rally to the Woods, and off we would go. But you're going to resolve this combat. Then you're going to roll, and you're going to determine how combat happened here, and then this unit is going to roll and do combat against this. So you could see before they ever get a chance to maneuver, they could get wiped out. Let's assume, you know, they, uh, they survive that combat. They have to retreat one third. You can see the nice coloring that happens here. And you can see he has to peel off and he goes into here. All right, I moved up right there. And you would just do the same for combat all down the line. Where it can get really interesting, obviously, is you can end up with a unit that gets surrounded on all four sides. And again, these pieces would be flipped up so that you could only see their kind of bare wood side. And again, that was one of the things I did not like. Not that I wanted to add more stickers, but boy, is it hard to tell. It's so much more cool and colorful to even look at them this way, but technically all these units would have taken one hit already. And in a future deal, instead of moving, they can recover, and they can, they can basically flip back down. But it made it real hard to run it. So, if this unit was completely surrounded, Custer's totally surrounded here, he has nowhere to retreat. So if he takes that, the first hit would flip his piece, the second hit would make him retreat, and if he can't retreat, he's gone. So, as you would imagine, you do not want to get surrounded. You want to try to maneuver or have your units in such a way that it's very difficult to get surrounded on all four sides. Battles continue until someone either withdraws or is defeated. Again, Custer wouldn't be able to withdraw here, but let's say that it was more like so, and he got lucky, all the combat happens, he could actually peel off and retreat back away from it on his own move. Um, if he even had a turn left as the movement happened, so we're not in a battle yet, but everybody's maneuvering in on him, and Custer has used his... Um, command status, his elite status, to get a turn near the end of the round, he, being the last to move, could actually pull out of this battle and move away. He could disengage. It's as if they hadn't quite been in combat yet, 
And he's like, whoa, this is getting bad. I'm pulling back to the woods and I'm putting the river to my back so I can't get hit from the rear. Um, so movement and combat really makes a lot of sense. It's not hard, very easy to teach, and it makes physical sense. All right, let me just show these last pieces. Okay, focus. All right, Matei, or Matthew, he brings his combat piece, his headquarters, his B company, and then he's got two Gatling guns, and whoops, I didn't grab, sorry, his supply. All right, if you have all four uh, battalions in there, you're going to be able to bring these guys in. So let me tell you how the supply and the Gatling guns work. Let's just put them up on this ridge. All right, so how do Gatling guns work? They can fire the distance of, they call it a trooper movement, on foot. So they can fire this distance. Now you can't have any friendly troops in the way. And um, if a unit, instead of moving, they fire. So they get to fire in that earlier phase, which is really nice. So they would be able to fire on these and on these. And what you do is you roll two dice for each one that's in range. Now, uh, the standard rules apply. Four, fives, and sixes are hits. So let's just say this unit had not been hit. If it were to take one hit, it would be flipped up. If it got hit again, it would have to retreat um, away, half a, a third of a move away from the battle, and if it got hit, um, if it was already in one of these states and it was taking that third hit, it's eliminated, it's killed. So you're simply rolling, so that would have been two misses for that, and you can't even see. The second you get a one, that gun's jammed and it's done firing, <laughs> okay? And that happened to me a lot. So then the next gun's going to fire, and it's going to do the same thing. So you can see it could be devastating, or it could have very little effect. Um, and if the Native Americans were to get their movement, and they're able to move up and simply touch or engage the Gatling gun in battle, it's immediately lost. It has no other capabilities. It's overrun, and it's destroyed. So again, you could see where the trooper's ability to try to exert their authority and go first or go early... Uh, you might have uh, Matei, Mathy, roll and say, yep, you got a three. His command status is three, so one, two, or three. And he could take his turn first and get that firing done and try to clear these troops. Supply is very cool, very crucial. If you are within a mile of the supply, so again, you're going to use your foot chain here. There's a mile marker right here, and yep, basically a little bit shy of the full mounted movement. But if you're within a mile of this supply chain, when you move, you get a free recover. So let's say these guys being displayed have all taken a single hit. If it, if it was their turn to move and they wanted to pull back, normally you have to stand and just recover all right, and you would recover and be full and fresh, but you wouldn't be able to move as well. These guys would be able to, because they're within the, the supply train, would be able to recover. So let's flip down and move. And let's say they came over to defend that supply train. So all of these guys could disengage, recover, and move, which is phenomenal. Because you're always stuck. If you're not near a supply train, you're always stuck saying, well... If I don't recover and basically get a hit point back, I'm going to, you know, they're, they're going to be so easy to kill. And you end up always trying to uh, recover them and not move. But if you've got that supply guy near you, you get the recover and move action. And that's how these special units work. Otherwise, it's all very straightforward. Your maneuvering has much more to do with the game than anything else. And again, your goal... The game will uh, end immediately once a uh, trooper is able to come up and touch a non-combatant. And that triggers the end of the game. And then victory is determined by this chart, which is how many cavalry units were included. So in this case, I had all four. And how many of the Sioux tribes were included. And then you cross-reference and say, okay, you've got to have gray. What is gray? That just means a non-combatant was captured, and if that victory condition has been met, you win. You can see some of them. So if you get into this area up here, 
Cavalry suffers less than 50% losses, and all non-combatants escape. So if I bring in less troops, I don't necessarily have to catch the non-combatants. I just got to not take a lot of uh, casualties, which means you can play the game a little bit different based on how many troops you bring out. And that is why that fog of war matters, because if I've only brought out one cavalry piece, Custer, and I hang back and linger, or I set myself up in the woods or whatever, I don't need to capture the pieces. I'm going to win if I just don't take a lot of casualties. So this player, the Native American players, have to be more aggressive in that case. And you never know, what if I brought out four, uh, and now I've got to push hard to do my capturing of the non-combatants, but you don't know that and you rush out uh, and expose yourself as a Native American player. And that's really where some of the cool strategy comes in. I've gone long. We'll get to my final thoughts. All right, we're back in. The neighbor's mowing. That's fine. I'm not up to mowing yet. I'm sure that'll be happening later. Just let that noise be in the background. So how did it play? Uh, I played several games. I played with my son, who's almost 11. This is his first foray into what uh, Custer, who Custer was, uh, into uh, he knew as soon as we sat down and played and I explained the rules, he was like, okay, he wanted to be the troopers. And then he had a little trepidation because he'd had enough education from school. He and I had never talked about it that he says, I don't, I don't know if I like being the troopers. Why are they wanting to go put these Native Americans on reservations? Why don't they just let them be? So we pause the game. First of all, that's great. That's what I love. This is now turned into a learning experience. So we talked, we had a discussion, um, and it really kind of ended with the brutal acts of what war is and how there's atrocities on both sides. And I hope I've prepped him for when he goes into school because then he was like, I'm definitely playing. I'll stay with the troopers. Later on, we switched it. In a game, and I played uh, the troopers. He was the Native Americans. And again, we'll get into more of that probably in a playthrough. But it was a great teaching tool. And the rules allowed him to do what he wanted to do as the commander. The little chains that, uh, that I've showed you for doing um, distance marking were so much better than... I mean, string would work, but the chains worked really well because right off the bat, he was moving the chain around to make sure he didn't go over a ridge and then down the other side for no reason and waste a third of his movement. Genius. He's literally snaking it through and saying, okay, I can get to here. And then he's moving his troops. So very intuitive. I love <clears throat> the little keychain things. Awesome. Those worked great. Um, the four turns that the Native Americans can't move, he struggled with that. That was fine with me. I was watching him, giving him tips when we flipped it around. And now he's moving. He's like, when do I go? When do I go? So I tried to go as quick. I knew my plan and I just tried to go boom, 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 get my guys moving. He saw what I was starting to do and I could see his mind ticking off and that was perfect. But that Native American player has to be patient. By the way, we only played with two people, obviously. The game says every... Everybody, you can have one person play a single battalion, or you can have one person play a single tribe, um, which which I don't, I, I wouldn't want to do it with 11 people. I could see doing it with four, or maybe even five, but I think it would degrade down a little bit. But who knows? It'd be a great teaching tool, so I'll say that. So, skipping ahead, it plays fun. It plays light. The way you splay out your troops and, and you're, if an if a enemy block can't fit between two of your, your blocks, uh, then they can't move through there. You've formed a line. You've made it so that you can protect your flanks. Perfect. Beautiful. That's what Pub Battles wants to do, is show you how you, how you can protect your flanks. Heck, how you can refuse your line even if you bend it back. I mean, it's perfect. Um... Battles are quick, the way they flood in on you, and then you fight until someone decides to withdraw. The fighting is brutal. Uh, it, it, it feels like what those guys would have gone through when, when you're the troopers, you feel the pressure of massive amounts of, of Native Americans just coming in on you. 
And I remember thinking, why didn't Custer get out of there? At one point, I pulled my guys into the woods. They took a hit. They recovered. Someone retreated into the woods. And I thought, yeah, pull them into the woods. The Gatling guns. We didn't use them in the first game. Um, and I pulled them out when I played the Troopers. And the Gatling guns stunk for me. My boy, well, first of all, he was mad. He's like, why didn't I get a chance to use Gatling guns? I was like, well, I didn't want to add that level of complexity in when you had it. Da, 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 da. He was like, that doesn't seem fair. I'm like, I understand. And then I got them. I got them up on a hill. They were well positioned. My other troops were out of the way. And here they go to start shooting. And click, click, hit, hit, jam. And then my next one, hit, jam. I'm like, what? And on his turn, he rushes them and they're out. I was like, they suck. And I totally could see like crank, 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 boom. The darn things jammed up again. He laughed because at the end of the game, he's like, let me see how long they would have lasted for me. On one Gatling gun, again, this is just for him having fun rolling dice, he rolled 16 times before he got a one. On the other one, it was like 32. I'm like, well, that would have been nice. So that was a cool swingy thing. I got to admit, the, the, um, the supply line, the mules, which move slower, awesome. As I explained in the rules, they allow uh, a trooper unit to a company to move and recover. Woo! Ah, all day long. I mean, I used the heck out of that. So overall... The game was fun, it was light, it was educational. Uh, my boys coming home from school and we had the game set up on a table down in the basement, right over there, matter of fact. And he's like, Dad, we got time, we got time. Can we go down and do a couple turns? Can we get a turn done? Yeah. Is your homework done? Yeah, 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 let's go down. Okay, he did that repeatedly until we'd finished the game. Then we immediately was like, can we set it up? I play the other side. Yes. So it has that fun, factor the maps cool the pieces look great oh one little caveat the pieces when they take a hit they flip up but when they're down you can't it's real hard to tell which one's from which unit and and they almost need another sticker but i didn't want to put more stickers on but i'm going to get like a colored ink pens or colored sharpies and just put little dots on them so you can tell oh that's that's the yellow tribe even though they're down you can, it's, it was real hard. You kind of had to move pieces and say, which group's that in? That's the only thing I didn't like here is it was fiddly because when they're in combat, they're touching each other. And sometimes you couldn't see what unit, or I couldn't remember, you know, I know, uh, Alpha Company is with, uh, Custer, but I could never remember like who's I Company with. Is it, are they with Reno? Are they with Benteen? Who are, I'm like, uh. Um, and if I could have had colored dots even for the troopers, <clears throat> it would have been phenomenal. So I'm going to do that. I didn't want to do it with stickers. I'll do it with an ink pen. That's probably my biggest negative. And then the quick start rules, I not really functional. I want to know how to play. The rules are simple. The rule book is simple. You've seen it. Um, just read that. The quick start didn't get me quick started. I was more like, what? This doesn't really even tell me how a phase goes or not a phase, but love the packaging, love the materials. It's expensive. This was a review copy. I didn't pay for this and I believe it's $89. And a lot of people I've talked to are like, yeah, it looked interesting, but I'm not paying that much for it. You know, the map is high quality and I believe that's where most of your cost is. That map is going to last for a thousand years. Okay. Maybe not. Probably. It's plasticized canvas is what it looks like. So I know it's a little pricey. Um, I love the look and feel. I actually think I'm going to display this game back here on my bar because this fits in with how some of the cans for whiskey um, in order to protect them. So, uh, but those are probably the only two negatives is I had some friends of mine say that's too expensive. Uh, they wouldn't pay that much for it. Um, and then a the little bit of the fiddliness. But boy, was this fun. And that's number one, that pub battles is really going for fun, quick, easy to learn. And the, the, the fact that what decision would you make as a commander? Not, well, can I move five hexes? Uh, they don't have hexes on their map, as you've seen. It's more like, well, I want to do this. I want to go there. They talk about Kriegspiel, uh, the war games from Germany, how, they, how you were moving miniatures, but they wanted to simplify that. They've achieved that, in my opinion. Lovely game. I'm going to see if there's some more, if they'll send me some more that uh, that they have because I, I like how 
educational and playable the system was. It's the Chief, bonding with board games. See you guys later.